yes madam visible okay okay madam so yesterday we discussed block 1 that is adaptation and mitigation so today we shall discuss block 2 of mev 023 that is agriculture forestry and other land uses so as you all know this is the third paper mev 023 it has four blocks so yesterday we discussed the first block that is adaptation and mitigation so today we shall discuss the second block which is agriculture forestry and other land uses so here also you have four units unit 6 7 8 and 9 so unit 6 it deals with agriculture unit 7 deals with forestry and other land uses unit 8 the interrelationships between the mitigation and adaptation in agriculture unit 9 is carbon capture and sequestration so one by one we will take the units so first let us take up <clears throat> the unit 6 that is agriculture see agriculture as you all know india is an agricultural country so indian economy a significant component of indian economy lies on agriculture and it contributes agriculture hello yes ma'am ma'am screen is not visible yeah. it's not visible madam it's not visible madam is this visible to us other yes, students yeah yeah it is also visible to us visible visible madam just check your net connection then okay so agriculture is one of the significant component of the indian economy and it contributes about 15% of the india's gdp and employs about 50% of our country's workforce so india is known for the production of pulses rice wheat spices fruits and vegetables so earlier we had less amount of the agricultural products and it is it was very difficult to feed for the population that existed in india but the green revolution it wiped off the famine by raising the crop fields and the white revolution that is the revolution for milk turned india into the world's largest milk producer so a number of factors are responsible for these achievements so first one is green revolution and second one is white revolution so it the in order to achieve this a favorable government policies receptivity of the farmers and the establishment of higher agricultural education institutes have a much role in order to achieve this the soil the water climate energy biodiversity resources are fundamental for the structure and function of agricultural ecosystem sustainability in order to support life on earth so the rapid depletion of natural sources like water soil energy biodiversity etc so it help it is responsible for the deterioration of the quality of air the quality of water the quality of soil and the destruction of ecosystem has resulted in the lo loss of fertile soils desertification reduction in forest cover decreasing the availability of fresh water and loss of biodiversity so these problems are not only seen in india but also in many nations of the world so sustainable activities it is sustainable activities are the activities it is for the present as well as for the future generation to increase the agricultural productivity through the adoption of best management practices 
which maintain the long term agroecological integrity of natural resources so when we see the agricultural revolutions are in india so the first one to mention is green revolution so the revolutions in india is for the food products the milk fish oil seeds fruits and vegetables etc so of course all these revolutions it has brought prosperity for the farmers so the term green revolution it is for agriculture which was coined in 1968 by dr william s god to describe the breakthrough in food grain production so green revolution refers to the quantum jump in the food grain production so sudden increase or the enhancement of food grain production so it is due to the use of high yielding varieties of plants use of fertilizers and pesticides coupled with the expansion of irrigation facility multiple cropping multiple cropping means so you are growing different types of crops in the same area and use of mechanized implements it has led to the green revolution so before the green revolution the problem of hunger and malnutrition was prevailed in the country dr norman borlaug an american agronomist humanitarian and nobel laureate he is known as the father of green revolution he said that he works with a large number of agricultural researchers especially dr m s swaminathan to pursue the government of india to accept accept high yielding wheat varieties so unfortunately we lost m s swaminathan a few days back finally the government of india agreed to import 18000 tons of seeds from mexico which marked the origin of green revolution so the father of green revolution in india is dr m s swaminathan so green revolution in india has led to the increased food grain production and as a result of new advances in technology as well as in mechanized implements it triggered high yielding varieties and it brought a complete change in the production technology marketing storage and extension so this is green revolution next is white revolution see before independence india was solely dependent on foreign milk products so milk was severely short in supply and it was considered as a luxury food product so even to get a liter of milk people used to stand in queues for hours so keeping the milk cattle earn out of its milk was not seen a great business proposition so the yields were very low and the indian breeds were far behind their foreign counterparts so as a result the white revolution has played an essential role in empowering women and their families for improving the living standards of rural india so operation flood program is leading to the white revolution in india which was started by national dairy development board in 1970s under the chairmanship of dr vargis kurian with the objective of creating a nation wide milk grid so the principal architect of this white revolution is dr vargis kurian also called as the father of white revolution so operation flood the program was implemented as a dairy program to generate self employment and regular incomes so in white revolution the focus was the introduction of exotic cattle breeds like holstein friesians and jersey and producing their cross breed so next one was yellow revolution so green revolution 
it is related to agriculture so yellow revolution uh, white revolution is milk and the yellow revolution is for oil seed production so this oil seed production in india the increase in oil seed production in india started in 1986 so the main objective of this revolution is to achieve self reliance in the production of oil seeds so this oil seeds technological machine was launched to ensure optimum utilization of production processing management and technology in oil seed crops so achieving the aim of making the nation self sufficient in oil seeds have a significant impact on agriculture and the economy and it serves to reduce the dependence on foreign markets so next one yes the rainbow revolution so as you see different colors in the rainbow so even the rainbow revolution indicate multiple form practices such as green revolution white revolution yellow revolution blue revolution for fisheries golden revolution for fruits silver revolution for eggs round revolution for potato pink revolution for meat and gray revolution for fertilizers so the concept of rainbow revolution it is an integrated development of crop cultivation horticulture forestry fishery poultry animal husbandry and food processing industry so rainbow revolution in agriculture is a step towards sustainability so india has already achieved resilience in agriculture through effective agricultural technology and suggest that the country is now on the threshold of a rainbow revolution that will ensure both household nutrition security and prosperity for its people so what are the strategies for sustainable agricultural management see sustainable agriculture means it is a kind of agriculture which aims in producing long term crops and livestock having minimal impacts on the environment so it's a right balance between the need for food production and conservation of the ecological system so the primary goal is to meet social needs especially food and fuel in the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs so according to fao there are five fundamental principles of sustainability in food and agriculture firstly improving the resources used efficiently is very crucial to attain sustainable agriculture so it requires immediate action to conserve protect and enhance natural resources agriculture that fails to protect and improve farm livelihoods equity and social well being is unsustainable enhanced resilience of rural people communities and ecosystem is vital to agriculture sustainability and sustainable food and agriculture require responsible and effective governance mechanisms so these are the five fundamental principles for sustainability in food and agriculture so what are the strategies for land degradation land degradation management see land degradation is a global issue because it causes adverse economic and environmental impacts so the direct causes are the anthropogenic induced which results in unsustainable land use and inappropriate land management practices such as deforestation and over exploitation of vegetation over grazing cultivation on steep slopes without the adoption of soil conservation measures shifting cultivation etc so what are the strategies to manage irrigation water see the country is placed as water stressed when water accessibility is less than 1700 uh, cube meter per capita per year where it is categorized as water scarce if it is less than 
cube meter per capita per year. India is already a water stress country with 1,544 cubic meter per capita water availability. So irrigation is essential for crop establishment and increasing fertilizer use efficiency. So a number of agronomic practices like raised bed planting, a ridge furrow method of sowing, subsurface irrigation, then precision farming, it offers a scope for economizing the water use. So higher water productivity can be improved by using the concept of multiple uses of water. So similarly, modern machinery such as laser and levelers, sprayers, precision seeders and planters, transplanters for rice and vegetable seedlings, multi-crop threshers, harvesters, Today, it allows a technically highly efficient form of farming and resource conservation. So the strategies for managing the organic matter in the soil. See, organic matter, see, soil is a mixture. It is a mixture of weathered rock particles and the organic matter. So organic matter is the decomposed substance of plant and animal origin. So the fertility of the soil is governed by a set of interactions like soil, soil nutrient status, physical soil conditions, and biological activity of soil. So organic matter is also essential for soil fertility, which maintains a good physical property like a water holding capacity, then soil structure, aeration, etc. So organic farming relies on health crop rotation, which includes the fertility depleting stages, returns of crop residues, nitrogen fixation by leguminous plants, and leguminous plants means the pulses, and the nutrient retention by green manures and effective use of manures or composts. So green manures or the cover and the cover crops, it forms an essential part of the organic system. But most farmers probably use them more effectively. So what are the strategies for sustainable livestock management? So livestock management, it is also one of a business of understanding of how to operate poultry farm, dairy farm, cattle ranches or other livestock related agri businesses. So traditional livestock management involves mixing animals and crops in the same form. So these systems are increase, increasingly undergoing intensification with farmers grazing higher densities of livestock and pasture and transitioning from grazing to confined operations. So intensive livestock systems exacerbate the impacts that livestock activities have on the environment, including effects on soil conditions, biodiversity, water quality and quantity, greenhouse gas emission, etc. So efforts to mitigate the impact of livestock on climate change, it focuses. Just a minute focus on reducing the greenhouse gas emission from livestock. So strategies for sustainable grazing and land management. See, overgrazing vegetation, it causes soil compaction and soil erosion. So increasing animal stocking rates, it puts pressure on the grazing lands, leading soil compaction and erosion grassland degradation, desertification in semi-arid areas. Healthy grazing lands give an economic base for various regions of the country. They are utilized for recreation, camping, hunting, fishing, and it provides habitat for different wildlife populations. So if it is properly managed, if the grazing is properly managed, it leads to sustainable sustainable grazing land management and manage forage soil water and grazing animals 
it to provide economic stability as well as water quality and quantity so strategies to reduce losses in the food supply chain see according to united nations food and agriculture organization one third of the food produced globally is wasted corresponding to the annual generation of about 1.3 billion tons of food waste which costs the world economy of about 750 billion dollars so saving one fourth of the food wasted globally would be enough to feed 870 million hungry people in the world of which the highest number are in india so according to the estimate of fao near 40% of india's fresh fruit and vegetables worth an annual 8.3 billion dollars perishes before reaching the consumers so according to a study conducted by iim kolkata cold storage facilities are available only for just 10% of india's perishable produce and they are mostly used for potatoes to meet india's robust demand for chips so the study estimates that india needs storage facilities for another 370 million metric ton of perishable produce so strategies for managing changing diet so over the past 50 years especially in the urban areas the income of the individual their preferences heating habits of indian indians have undergone tremendous changes the culture the environment the social and economic circumstances have influenced the changes in proper diet as a on a national level so the western food products and industrialization of food production processing has significantly influenced the heating eating habits especially in the youth so the average daily protein the average daily protein consumption is in india has increased from 55 grams per day to 59 during 1990 to 2015 so the fraction of dietary energy supplied from cereals and roots has declined from 66 to 59 grams per day so moreover the consumption of food grains has declined while the average daily sugar and fat intake have raised so the current scenario reflects some disturbing tendencies for human nutrition so it is essential to improve the availability of multigrain types of food especially the coarse grains like millets and other nutritious food like pulses to achieve nutritional security So apart from this the fruits and vegetables they are rich source of micronutrients and it gives health giving phytochemicals which are potent antioxidants and detoxifying agents to protect against a number of degenerative diseases So the foods from animal origin which includes the milk egg meat and fish abound in quality proteins and a rich source of long chain fatty acids which play an important role in the physiology of the body so this is about the first unit that is agriculture so agriculture sustainable agricultural productivity agricultural revolutions in india such as green revolution white revolution yellow revolution rainbow revolution and what are the different strategies for sustainable agricultural management first one is strategies for land degradation management strategies to manage irrigation water strategies to manage organic matter in soils strategies for sustainable livestock strategies for sustainable grazing land management strategies to reduce losses in the food supply chain strategies for managing changing the indian diet so this is about the first unit the agriculture second one is forestry and other land uses c 
See, as we all know, forests have always been a valuable to human beings and it has played a vital role in the history of civilization. So nearly half the global population depend on wood for cooking and in developing countries, it remains as the primary heating fuel. So the forests provide numerous goods and services to maintain the life supporting system, which is essential for life on earth. So some of the significant economic and environmental importance are it supplies a timber, fuel wood, fodder and a wide range of non-wood products. Natural habitat for biodiversity and repository of genetic wealth. Provision of recreation and opportunity for ecotourism. And it plays an integral part of the watershed to regulate the water regime, conserve soil and control, flood, uh, control floods and carbon sequestration and the carbon sink. So next one is deforestation. So the term deforestation describes the complete long term removal of tree cover. According to United States, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Just a minute. Hello. Sorry for disturbance. So deforestation. So the term deforestation, it describes the complete long term removal of tree cover. So according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, deforestation is the permanent destruction of forests to make the land available for other uses. Deforestation is one of the leading causes of the ecological degradation and has a severe impact on human life and environment. So the loss of forest cover influences the climate and contributes to a loss of biodiversity. So what are the causes and the consequences of deforestation? So conversion of forest to agricultural land to feed the growing population is often the leading cause of deforestation. The second cause of deforestation is mining operations. The tropical forests are the location of various deposits of minerals and ores containing diamonds, oil, aluminium and gold. So these forests are destroyed to extract these materials from the the forests are destroyed to extract these materials from the soil. So another reason for deforestation is cattle ranching. So the cattle ranchers, they clear the forest to make a scope for grazing the cattle. So dams built for hydroelectric power plants are another reason for deforestation. Fuel load from the unmanaged forest is also a cause of deforestation. So there are a number of causes for deforestation and a few of these are the mining operations, then the agricultural land to feed the growing population, then cattle ranching, the building of dams, etc. So the consequences, the consequences of deforestation includes the mining. It causes soil erosion, the formation of sinkholes, loss of biodiversity, contamination of soil, groundwater and surface water by toxic chemicals released from the mining processes. Then overgrazing, overgrazing reduces the value, fertility and biodiversity of the area and it is one of the cause of desertification and soil erosion. So the destruction of these forest resource, resources, it results in the loss of those species which are still unknown. 
So the over exploitation of forest for various types of forest based raw material such as resin, turpentine, they are also responsible for the destruction of trees in those mountainous regions. So fire casualties create environmental pollution, stress and results in adverse effects on forest ecology and fatalities in the wildlife population. So deforestation, it results in the loss of biodiversity and the germplasm having a devastating effect on ecological balance. So the loss of habitat, it leads to species extinction. It also has a negative consequences for local population who depend on the animals and plants in the forest for hunting and medicine. So deforestation is considered as one of the contributing factors to global climate change due to increase in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. So what are the mitigation? How to reduce these activities? So there are a wide uh, types of, of uh, wide measures, a wide range of policy statements, legislative and regulatory measures have been established to protect the forests, but it needs to be properly implemented. So the policies and laws should be in such a way that should encourage the local people and institutional participation in forestry management and conservation, along with safeguarding the indigenous people's traditional rights and tenure with appropriate sharing of benefits. So the effects of deforestation on environment. Deforestation has a number of negative effects on the environment. So the most dramatic impact is the loss of habitat for a number of species. So we are losing the biodiversity. So according to National Geographic, 70% of the Earth's land animals and plants live in forests and they are lost due to deforestation as, they as that destroys their habitat. See, the roots of the trees which are growing in the forest, they anchor, they are get attached to the soil. So the soil is without the trees, the soil is free to wash or blown away, which we call it as the soil erosion. Removal of the top layer of soil is called as soil erosion. It is either by wind or water. And once the trees are uprooted, once the trees are removed, the soil, the top soil, the fertile soil is washed off, which can lead to vegetation growth problems. So eventually the rain washes down the soil surfaces and erosion takes place. And it leads to silt, which enters into the water bodies like lakes, streams, rivers, etc. So this decreases the quality of water and contributes to poor health in populations in that particular area. So secondly, deforestation results in reduced rainfall. Reduced rainfall, increased drought, warmer summer and colder winter. So moist and fertile land of forest, it may be converted to deserts due to decreased amount of rainfall and no floods. The soil is exposed to the sun's heat and the moisture of the water content present in the soil, it gets dried up and gets eroded by wind and water. So this erosion results in loss of nutrients, loss of organic matter, and finally, it leads to desertification, which makes the soil of no use. So deforestation, it also results in the loss of the biodiversity, having a devastating effect on ecological balance. It can also lead to species extinction. So it also has a negative consequences for local populations who rely on the animals and plants in the forest for hunting and medicine. So deforestation is considered as one of the contributing factor to global climate change due to increase in the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. See, when the trees are removed, see the trees absorb the carbon dioxide presence in the, present in the atmosphere by a process called photosynthesis. So when trees are removed, there is excess of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, which leads to the global climate 
change. So how to prevent or reduce deforestation? So it is just the opposite by planting new plants. So reforestation and afforestation are used to achieve enough forest cover to increase the forested lands. So the cutting of the trees, it should be replaced by planting the young trees and the older ones or the older ones which are cut or replaced by the younger plants. So for all purposes where forest products are used today, other materials could not be substituted at a larger scale. So as long as there is a market for wood products, trees are continuously cut down and the solution lies in planting or in utilizing the plant trees in non-forest areas like barren land, marginal land, community land, degraded forest land, etc. So there is a direct need for land reforms to address the issue of deforestation. So additionally, the forest rights of indigenous people needed to be safeguarded. Further education coupled with the training of forest managers and other stakeholders can greatly aid them to adopt sustainable forest related activities. A wide range of policy statements, legislative and regulatory measures have been established to protect the forest, but it has to be implemented properly. So the policies and laws should be in such a way to encourage the local people and institutional participation in forestry management and conservation along with safeguarding indigenous people's traditional rights and tenure with appropriate sharing of benefits. So afforestation is the conversion from other land uses into the forest to increase the canopy cover to 10% defined threshold for the forest. It is essentially the transformation of land which has not been forested earlier through seeding and planting. So afforestation is extremely a viable option to continue the overuse of forest and also it can meet the needs of human beings. So what are the advantages and limitations of afforestation? See, advantage, the best advantage is to restore the ecological balance of all ecosystems, which maintains biodiversity, conservation of soil and water resources, water resources. It prevents flood and safeguard the society. So it has certain limitations also. So you have a number of advantages. It provides jobs and employment for tree planters. It can en enhance the supply of timbers. It provides the habitats for wildlife. And it, the roots of the trees help, the, help to bind the soil together, preventing soil erosion. So planting of trees in semi-arid semi -arid areas increases the amount of rainfall. And the process of afforestation also often gets used as a method for river banks and ravine lands management through the course of sustaining river banks, as well as acting as an interception of rainwater to go straight into the river. So these are a number of advantages. The limitation is the land can no longer be used for agriculture or residential buildings, which could perhaps benefit society through greater outputs of food and a greater supply of housing. So next is afforestation in degraded site. Afforestation can, can be practiced in a number of sites. One such site is the degraded site. Degraded site means the salinity, the salt content, where the, the land with high amount of soil, high amount of aridity, low fertility, uh, extremes of soil pH, it may be acidic or alkaline, and the, the poor quality waters, the fragile land structures, it makes the soil unfit for proper cultivation. So these lands can be allocated for taking up afforestation programs. So the afforestation is mainly focused on wastelands, desert, salt affected soil, ravine lands, then coastal shifting sands, etc. 
so under these circumstances or extreme conditions so the tree species which where the wood is very hard can be grow so afforestation can also be practiced in desert also so accordingly see afforestation in the desert it is of course a tough venture because of the climatic conditions the high temperature low rainfall and high wind velocity so accordingly a tree in the desert must be extremely strong or hard to endure adverse environmental condition so afforestation is done to stop presently to prevent wind erosion of soil and sand particles which deposits on the nearby areas so a number of plants can be grown but the most commonly grown tree in this arid and the semi arid it belongs to the genus prosopis so afforestation in salt affected soil see the soil is also affected by number of salts and make the soil alkaline so the salts of sodium calcium magnesium potassium and sulfate they are present in the saline soils which covers the land in the form of a white layer so this is also called as ray or color so the problem in saline soils are first one is presence of salt second one is non availability of quality irrigation water so under these circumstances so the focus is on the choice of tree species planting method and silvicultural practices so tree species suitable for afforestation in salt affected soils or acacia nilotica and acacia catechu so these are the plants grown in salt affected soils see each soil each type of in all types of soils we cannot go or we cannot grow all the plants so each one has its own type of species or plant species to be grown so afforestation in denuded hill slopes so the hills have been denuded by uncontrolled fellings associated with excessive grazing and frequent fires so in most of the regions the surface soil has been eroded even the subsoil the subsoil is below the top soil so usually in erosion wind erosion or water erosion the surface the top soil is removed and in certain areas especially in the hilly slopes the layer the top soil below is called as the subsoil it is also eroded so practically no soil material is present so these soils they are generally poor in moisture and nutrient content so these adverse conditions make the afforestation operation difficult on denuded hill slopes so soil preparation in denuded hill slopes includes formation of contour trenches patches and pits so these are done mainly in preventing soil erosion and helps in conservation of water and soil see when the slopes are very steep digging of trenches it's not possible in such cases pits are prepared for planting for sowing etc so the choice of the tree species depends on a number of factors like the climatic conditions the growth habit the endurance of the tree etc for example so pine trees are more suitable in subtropical area acacia species in dry subtropical area so deodar are suited for temperate zone so in the dry areas of northwest india acacia species like acacia catechu acacia modesta is grown so like this the choice of the tree species mainly depends on the local species growth habit climatic conditions etc so afforestation in ravine lands ravine formation begins along with the river sites and encroaches upon the catchment area by headward growth so the ravines are characterized by the absence of vegetation of any type so here also the run off water is maximum the slopes are very steep and ravine afforestation has to be carried out on catchment basis with other operations of soil and water conservation 
So in order to achieve better results, the afforestation of ravines may be accompanied by proper management of agricultural lands. So prevention of erosion by making the gullies of the slope gentle and by diverting the surface flow is one of the essential prerequisite for any forestry and other land uses successful afforestation program. See, afforestation is also practiced in coastal areas. Coastal areas near the seashore areas where there is a shifting of the sands. So the tides are responsible for deposition of sand in the seacoast area. So the sands are vulnerable to shifting due to the impact of prevailing wind. So these coastal sands do not hold the moisture. So the plant like Casherina, it has been found to be the best species which is growing in the coastal sands. So even in the mining area, we can practice afforestation. So the, it has led to most of the world's nations adopting regulations to moderate the adverse effects of mining operations. So the species which are successful in the mining area includes the Dalbergia sisu, eucalyptus, acacia, etc. So there are two ways in order to regenerate a forest. One is natural regeneration and the other one is artificial regeneration. Regeneration is the renewal of forest crop by nature. So natural regeneration is, is indeed a renewing of a forest either through self-sown seed or by vegetative parts. So it is a primary process on which a forester can rely to influence the dynamics of forest stands and to preserve the genetic characteristics of a local tree population. So the following methods are used for natural regeneration of forest or by other artificial means. See, so first one is natural regeneration from the seed. See, so it is one of the standard method to regenerate the forests. See, the seeds are destroyed by insects, birds, rodents, etc. But a small proportion that is less than 10%, it survives to germinate provided they are deposited on a proper site where the optimum condition exists. When the seed falls on the ground just near the tree or away due to various dispersal agents, the seeds may not germinate. Sorry, the seeds may germinate. So the tree species have a maximum and minimum temperature for their seed germination, relatively above or below of which germination does not take place. See, first of all, the seeds are eaten by a number of insects, birds and rodents. Only 10% is remaining and this 10% also in order to grow or in order to germinate it requires a suitable temperature suitable uh, area or the two suitable habitat and if there is an adverse temperature or adverse conditions or if there is any deficiency in water there are these 10 percent surviving seeds also cannot germinate so most tree species seeds germinate in the dark and few species they require light so germination is a very important stage in the growth of the tree seedling. So as the tree seed moves from an inactive to active stage, the delicate seedling roots, it emerges and establishes in the soil before a young shoot appears above ground. So natural regeneration from vegetative parts. So natural regeneration of tree stands by vegetative parts it is that is the copies is one of the important methods in forestry. So what is this copies? Copies is defined as a shoot arising from an adventitious bud at the base of a woody plant that has been cut near the ground or burnt back. So copies is a shoot which arises from 
the adventitious but there are a number of buts at the base of the plants woody plants that has been cut near the ground or burnt back so crop from kopis is called as kopis crop and similarly the forest developed from kopis crop is called as the kopis forest kopising comprises of cutting young tree stems down to a base or less from the ground level to encourage the new shoots to form so it is usually practiced in winter or when the tree enters into a inactive period that is the dormant period so new shoots it grows the following spring so kopising produces multi stemmed growth rather than a single primary trunk so in a forest setting trees are kopised in rotational segments with trees in varying stages by this way wood is regularly available for harvest so kopis in a forest stands composed of stools that produces kopis shoots which form a major part of the crop so in a simple kopis the crop is clear felled to give even aged stands which may be of a single species such as hazel or sweet chestnut so kopis with standards is a system in which selected stems are retained at each felling to form an uneven aged overstory of standards which are removed selectively by a rotation which is a multiple of the kopis cycle so other than this other the vegetative parts includes the root sucker seedling kopis stool kopis and polarading polarading is defined as a tree whose stem has been cut off to get a flush of shoots usually above the height to which the browsing animals can reach it is an operation in which the stem of a tree is cut off at a height usually about 1.5 or 2 meters with the objective of obtaining a bunch of new shoots so next one is these are all the natural methods of regeneration next one is artificial regeneration so artificial regeneration is again the renewal of the forest crop by sowing planting or other artificial means so again here also the artificial means of raising is either by sowing the seed or by planting so the steps in artificial regeneration includes the choice of species the choice of the method and the site selection so artificial regeneration by vegetative methods includes the seedlings cuttings layerings rhizome suckers offset these are all the these are all the vegetative parts of the plant where it is used for regeneration method so bulbs corms bulbs means the onion bulb corm amorphophallus rhizomes suckers these are different methods of vegetative propagation so in each one you have different types for example in cutting you have stem cutting root cutting etc similarly layering also you have different types next one is forest management to increase the carbon density so terrestrial carbon sequestration is a potential area for climate change mitigation as the carbon sequestration enables sequestering reducing the atmospheric carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis so the sink sink means the redu reduction the sink of carbon sequestration in forests and wood products it helps to offset the sources of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere such as deforestation forest fires and fossil fuel emissions so next one is silvicultural management so what is the silvicultural management silviculture means growing of trees is called as silviculture so there is a tremendous scope for silviculture in india because the need of the growing population that is shortage of fuel fodder and quality timbers etc silviculture has a vast scope in meeting these demands through multi purpose tree species so we are also facing a number of environmental problems and impact of climate change in some part of the country so silviculture has the scope to combat the adverse effects of climate change through carbon sequestration and it directly reduces the build up of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere 
See, this silviculture, it permits the growing of suitable tree species. It provides the raw material for cottage industries, efficient utilization of resources. It helps in maintaining ecological balance, soil and water conservation, soil improvement, and helps in meeting various needs of growing population. So to conclude the second topic, so we have learned the what is deforestation? What are the ways in order to reduce the deforestation? How to mitigate? Degradation can aid in mitigating climate change. Afforestation, reforestation, it was also an important mitigation strategy. And afforestation strategies in different areas like salt affected soil, coastal shifting sands, denuded hill slopes, ravine lands, degraded site, mining area, desert regions, etc. So this is the second unit, that is the forests. The third unit, unit 8, is the interrelationships. Interrelationships between mitigation and adaptation in agriculture. So agriculture is one of the sectors that is severely affected by adverse climatic conditions. Since agricultural production is extremely vulnerable to underlying climate risks such as drought, intense and erratic rainfall, temperature shifts, etc. So adaptation and mitigation, these two processes, it reduces the risk and impact of climate change. So mitigation is to reduce the emission sources or enhance the sink of greenhouse gases. So it helps it benefits the global climatic conditions in the long term, while adaptation provides both short and long term benefits at the local level. So the integration of adaptation and mitigation responses, in some cases, it generates mutual benefits as well as to introduce co-benefits with development policies. So climate change adaptation strategies should aim at maintaining or even increasing the food production in exporting developed and developing regions or in regions key to regional food security. Any significant change in food production in these areas, including the change resulting from climate change impact, has a potential to affect global and regional availability, stability and access to food through direct and indirect repercussions. So climate change adaptation, it emerges as the best option to climate to proof the agriculture sector to improve the livelihoods and thus eradicating poverty. So farmers have always adopted to the changes in the climate. So the types of adaptation responses, it is broadly classified into short term adaptation and long term responses. So the short term adaptation is changing in sowing dates by shifting the sowing dates and the extended growing season associated with the climate warming, shifting of cultivars or crops with increased tolerance to the most dominant stress factors, etc. So next one is, just a minute. The long term, so long term practices. So the long-term transformative responses, which requires strategic planning, is usually implemented at a larger scale. It may be regional level, national level, or international level. So the climate change adaptation measures in agriculture includes strengthening management of water resources, so improvement in the livestock breeds, then promoting the use of indigenous and scientific knowledge, strengthening the early warning systems and putting more emphasis on incentives to enhance the farmer capacity, promoting capacity building through research and development, training in climate change related issues, promoting the climate indexed insurance solutions, building resilience in managing climate related disasters such as drought, hailstorms, erratic rainfall and floods. So mitigation of climate change in the agriculture sector. So the main mitigation options involve one or more of the three strategies. One is reduction or provision of emissions to the atmosphere by conserving the existing carbon pools in soils. 
the key mitigation initiatives aim in carbon sequestration through measures like agroforestry agriculture as well as the forestry organic farming emission reduction through improved livestock feed and dietary management and sustainable grassland management so interaction between mitigation and adaptation so the adaptation change strategies to climate change have both short and long term consequences so mitigation measures generally have long term benefits and in many countries the policies pertaining to economics environment and agriculture sector have indeed far reaching consequence on mitigation strategies in agriculture so examples of synergies synergies means combining combining adaptation and mitigation so reduction of nitrous oxide emissions can lead to improved groundwater quality and reduce loss of biodiversity so mitigation interventions like cropland management pastureland management soil management livestock management these are recommended to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions so mitigation strategies results in adaptation benefits so adaptation measures increasing the temperature to reduce the crop yields to sensitive crops demanding the farmers to adjust the crop management and livestock rearing and the secure the stability of agro ecosystem so to conclude this third unit the interactions between adaptation and mitigation is very important and the adaptive actions have positive negative as well as neutral effects on mitigation and vice versa is also true so adaptation strategies such as water savings and soil conservation can maintain and sequester carbon the carbon may or uh, payments can contribute to local adaptation through diversification of livelihoods and improved economic resilience to climate shocks and the development of fast growing tree monoculture aims at maximizing the carbon sequestration carbon reducing it reduces the options for ecological adaptation so in order to address the negative interactions and to facilitate their realization of mutually beneficial outcome it is necessary to take these interactions into account so next one is the carbon capture the last unit of this first uh, the second block is carbon capture and sequestration so the rapidly increasing atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that has initiated unprecedented changes in climate systems which has led to severe ecological and economic disruptions so there are the various factors which has increased the concentration of greenhouse gases are mainly the population growth intensive agricultural practices change in land use and deforestation industrialization and associated energy use from fossil fuels etc so anthropogenic in addition to this anthropogenic energy related carbon dioxide emissions have also contributed immensely to the increased greenhouse gas concentration so the need to identify options for mitigating atmospheric carbon dioxide of is widely recognized so in this context the rapid application of carbon capture and storage and carbon sequestration is a mean to tackle emissions from both existing and future sources ccs that is carbon capture and storage carbon sequestration are the core component of national and global emission reductions scenarios wild wild so a diverse range of carbon capture and storage technologies are currently at various stages of research development and demonstration so while a few of these technologies have reached the deployment stage many still require significant further development work to improve technical capabilities to reduce the costs so carbon capture and sequestration known as ccs it is a process which involves capturing man made carbon dioxide at its source and storing it permanently underground so ccs is sometimes referred to as ccus carbon capture utilization and storage so ccs 
carbon capture and uh, uh, sequestration. It reduces the amount of carbon dioxide. It is one of the carbon dioxide, as you all know, it is one of the important greenhouse gas emitted to the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels at power plants and other industrial facilities. So the integrated CCS system, it includes three main steps. The first step is capturing and separating carbon dioxide from other gases. Second one is purifying, compressing and transporting the captured carbon dioxide to the sequestration site. And final step is injecting the carbon dioxide into the underground geological reservoirs. So this is the global carbon cycle. So global carbon cycle, it is the movement of the carbon between the atmosphere and vegetation, soils and the oceans over times ranging from years to millennia and longer. So there are different global carbon pools. And next one is the carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration is mainly based on the natural process of photosynthesis and conversion of atmospheric carbon dioxide into biomass, soil organic matter or humus. Natural process of sequestering carbon into terrestrial and aquatic systems, they are most cost effective and it has numerous benefits such as enhancement of ecosystem services compared with the engineered techniques and conversion of carbon dioxide into carbonates. So carbon sequestration in terrestrial ecosystems comprises soils and biota and it is one of the possible strategies which is considered to stabilize the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So based on the carbon sequestration, you have three types, terrestrial carbon sequestration, geological carbon sequestration, and oceanic carbon sequestration. So terrestrial carbon sequestration is a process by which the atmospheric carbon dioxide is used up, is taken up by the plant, by the plants, by the process of photosynthesis and which is usually stored in the biomass and soils and it is one of the mitigation method and soil carbon sequestration human activities human activities from historic times to present have altered the soil ability to store the carbon so the carbon balance of agricultural land and other land use changes such as loss of wetlands and deforestation it has resulted in significant loss of soil organic carbon. So the agronomic practices and land management to reverse the carbon loss to the atmosphere has to be, is it is one of the potential way to sequester the soil carbon. Next one is geological carbon sequestration. So it involves the capturing carbon dioxide from the exhaust of fossil fuel based power plants and other sources. So the carbon dioxide injected underground, it may raise upwards until it is trapped below the impermeable layer. It is similar to the natural phenomenon that traps oil and gas. Third one is oceanic carbon sequestration. So the world's ocean or the primary long-term sink for human-caused carbon dioxide emission, it results in the deliberate sequestration but occurs naturally through chemical reactions between seawater and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But these reactions, it makes the oceans to become more acidic. So marine organisms and ecosystems depend on the formation of carbonate skeletons and sediments that are vulnerable to dissolution in acidic waters. So the impact of ocean acidification and deliberate ocean fertilization on coastal and marine food webs and other sources are poorly understood. So scientists are studying the effect of ocean carbon sequestration on these environments. So application of carbon capture and storage technology, which is called as CCS, carbon dioxide capture and storage, offers an important avenues for making use of fossil fuels more judicially with climate change mitigation op options. See, CCS, it is a potential technology which involves the capture, transport, and long-term long -term storage of carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide captured by CCS technology, it can be compressed and transported for storage purpose either in oceans, geological formations, or for use in industrial processes. 
So the potential storage methods comprise geological storage, ocean storage, and industrial fixation. The CCS technology, it captures about 90% of the carbon dioxide emission from the power plants and industrial establishment. So it the carbon dioxide captured using this technology can find use in enhanced oil recovery, stored in geological formations and manufacture of building materials. So the CCS technology, it ha has got also certain limitations. It requires approximately 15 to 25 percent of more energy depending on the particular type of technology used and it needs more fuel than the conventional plants so to conclude this topic the reduction of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is crucial for mitigating the climate change so the climate scenarios that keep that keep the global warming it relies on large-scale application of technologies which removes the carbon dioxide from the air on a huge scale so ccs technology is a critical carbon dioxide emission abatement technology so there are three major elements of ccs that is capture separation transport and storage so this is about the carbon capture and sequestration technology application of CCS technology, advantages and limitations of CCS technology. So this block, so that is the second block, agriculture, forestry and other land uses. So in the first block, we studied the sustainable agriculture practices in different kinds of lands, forestry, deforestation, afforestation, reforestation, interrelationship between the mitigation and adaptation in agriculture, and the last one is carbon capture and sequestration. So this is about the block two. So tomorrow we shall discuss the block three at same time. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.